My name is Fei Fei Li. I'm the co-director of uh, Stanford Institute of Human-Centered AI. So welcome to Stanford High's uh, headquarters space. Um, it's truly an honor to be here. First of all, welcome President uh, Mark Tessier Levine uh, for attending this. And our guest of honor doesn't really need any introduction, but never, nevertheless, I will uh, get started here. Um, uh, we are very honored to host a talk and then later a discussion by uh, Demis Hassabis, the founder and CEO of uh, uh, Alphabet DeepMind. Demis uh, started his career in video gaming, developing new games at a few studios before launching his own. So for those of you who are taking away games from your kids, think twice. Um, um, then uh, Demis headed back to um, school for a PhD in cognitive neuroscience to better understand the architecture of uh, brain um, at MIT, right? So through various places, MIT, Harvard, University of College, London, uh, Demis uh, has always been this very creative uh, thinker and leader in thinking about the relationship between machine intelligence, human brain, and and so on. And then in 2010, he co-founded DeepMind. Um, you all know DeepMind. It is one of the first um, AI, truly AI companies of, of our era. And it was acquired by Google uh, in 2014. DeepMind has made breakthroughs in data center energy consumption, generative, uh, uh, de in this case, degenerative eye conditions uh, uh, and uh, protein folding through the very impressive alpha fold um, uh, work that we all have heard of. It has made significant advances in the realm of deep learning and reinforcement learning. And true to Demis gaming roots, uh, DeepMind has also beaten a few uh, world champions at, uh, at the very ancient game Go. Um, now DeepMind is looking uh, to apply techniques from alpha fold to nuclear fusion in hopes of uh, halting our climate uh, crisis. I hope we're going to hear more about that. And of course, uh, uh, DeepMind and Demis teams is, um, are exploring ideas around um, what they have pioneered the term uh, artificial general intelligence, uh, where uh, which uh, Demis has called this an epoch-defining technology that will change the very fabric of human lives. And before I just turn the podium to uh, Demis, I do want to uh, say that the um, when HAI was founded, Stanford High was founded back in 2019, Demis was part of our founding dis distinguished fellows, acknowledging his profound impact in the field of AI. And uh, I cannot think of a better person, a better name, a better leader to be here today to talk about AI, given all that is going on in the world. AI has truly had a public awakening moment, and uh, it's no longer just a niche field that nerds like us uh, play around. It's impacting human life, society, and our future. And HAI has been missioned to be one of the forums that will host this kind of intellectual discourse about AI and the societal impact. So especially to the uh, audience students today, not only you're here for a treat to hear what Demis has to say, I hope you engage in a dialogue with him after this talk. So without further ado, Demis, please, thank you. Thanks so much, Fei-Fei, for that great, uh, very uh, generous introduction. It's really amazing to be here, and thanks for inviting me. Um, as Fei Fei mentioned, obviously the HAI was set up in I think 2019, and uh, this is actually my first time to be here physically because of obviously COVID and all the travel restrictions, everything got in the way. We've been meaning to do this for years, so now finally I'm here, and it's great to be here. And I hope to be here a lot more often. Um, I have a lot of uh, reasons to come over to the Bay Area, so um, I hope to to pop in here every now and again. So I'm going to cover uh, my talk today, um, trying to the sort of real passions of mine, which is to use AI uh, to accelerate scientific discovery itself. 
Um, and of course, at the end of the talk, I'll also just discuss a lot about um, the current vogue of uh, generative models and uh, generative AI and, and, and large language models and, and the work we're doing in, in that part too. And maybe that can lead into some of the Q&A and discussion that we'll have afterwards. The DeepMind was founded way back in 2010, almost like uh, the middle, the medieval times now of AI, um, you know, this 12, 13 years ago now. And it's been incredible to see um, we've been in this sort of very amazing position of being kind of at the forefront of where um, uh, the whole AI field was going. And it's been sort of, we, we expected things to go sort of like this, but um, even for us, it's been amazing to actually just live through that. So back in 2010, it was very difficult to even, I remember trying to raise our seed round of you know, a few hundred thousand dollars. It was almost impossible to do. And, uh, and these days, you know, it seems like uh, a billion dollar rounds are being done every other week. Um, and that's just in, you know, just over a decade, a very short amount of time. And back then in 2010, if you can, some of you, most of you not old enough to cast your minds back to that, but it's, it's, it was just nobody was talking about AI. Uh, very few people were talking about AI, and certainly not general AI. Um, and it's, in, you know, it's certainly in academia where uh, Shane Legg and I, because Shane Legg's the chief scientist of DeepMind, were studying. Um, it was almost, you almost get eye rolls from professors and other things if you discussed about uh, this sort of more general AI or the original aims of the AI field uh, to build uh, human-like intelligence. So it's been kind of astounding to see what's happened. Um, and obviously, things are changing incredibly fast, even, even, uh, even month by month now. So we set up DeepMind in 2010 because we felt there was a lot of different techniques coming together that we could see deep learning um, had just been invented. Uh, and we've always been big proponents of reinforcement learning. Um, and we wanted to bring those things together along with some understanding we had about the, the human brain. Um, I, my PhD, I worked on the hippocampus and memory systems and imagination, uh, made some interesting discoveries in, in, in that domain that I thought would also potentially carry over into ideas for AI systems and AI architectures. Um, and we thought all of that was coming together and also the advent of um, a lot of compute power, um, and specifically GPUs, uh, which ironically, of course, were invented for games. So everything for me, as you'll see, comes back to games one way or another. Um, so uh, what's, what was our mission for the DeepMind? Well, we thought of it as a kind of an Apollo program effort. If we really went for this with um, intense focus and ambition, uh, we felt that a lot of progress could be made quite quickly. Um, that's how, how it turned out. Um, and our, our mission statement was to sort of try and solve intelligence. And by solve, I mean um, uh, fundamentally understand the nature of intelligence and then try to recreate that in an artificial construct and then use it to advance science and uh, benefit all of humanity. And we're still very much on that same mission today. So what did we start off with? Well, I think our first big result was back in around 2013, where um, we finally managed to scale up what then became called deep reinforcement learning systems um, to something that was actually significant, a significant scale and quite challenging for humans to do. Uh, and we went to the earliest game systems that were popular at all, which was the Atari systems from the 1970s. And you might recognize Space Invaders here. And the, the set of around 50 games that were on the emulators for Atari uh, systems. And uh, what we built with Atari DQN, our first sort of big successful system, was that um, a system that learned how to play uh, and, and maximize the score just by um, uh, only being given the pixels on the screen, the raw pixels on the screen. So it was very much um, probably the first example of a kind of end to end learning system uh, on something. Uh, they're working on something really challenging, perceptually challenging, like, uh, like an Atari game. So that was uh, um, an incredible moment for us. And I remember when, you know, back in 2012, 2011, when we were struggling to even win a single point at a game like Pong. Um, and we were just sort of wondering, well, maybe we're just 20 years too early um, uh, with these ideas of, of learning systems. Um, and then suddenly it won a point, then it won a game, and then it didn't lose any points. And then eventually, by 2013, it was playing all the Atari games. Of course, uh, we then took that much further, and, and maybe um, still the thing we're most well known for is um, the program AlphaGo that Fei Fei mentioned, where we tried to crack uh, the game of Go, um, really the kind of the Everest of uh, game AI, 
And uh, we needed to do it through self-learning systems. So um, all of you hopefully will know Go, this super complex game that's played in Asia. It's got more posi possible positions, 10 to the 170 by one estimate than there are atoms in the universe. So one cannot um, possibly brute force uh, uh, th this uh, uh, solutions to, to uh, Go. And in fact, furthermore, even play people who play Go, the top masters, they don't really understand and can't explicitly uh, explain what the rules are, or the heuristics are that they're following. So unlike chess players, uh, they, you know, and that we can kind of distill chess players, grandmasters' knowledge into a set of rules and then program um, basically expert system chess computers to play pretty well like Stockfish. Um, that approach is impossible, was impossible with Go. So you have to use this learning approach. You have to allow um, uh, the Go system to learn for itself. Then obviously, famously in 2016, we had this massive million-dollar challenge match in Seoul. 200 million people watched the match around the world. Um, and AlphaGo famously won that match 4-1. But more important than it winning was the creative strategies that AlphaGo came up with, most notably Move 37, which is shown here in this diagram, the red uh, circled in red um, in game two that really um, blew the Go, go you know, the Go world uh, and all the Go experts sort of blew them away in terms of uh, this novel idea that no human expert would have ever played. Um, and, and because it's basically on the fifth line uh, and it's very early on in the game and that's sort of unthinkable to do uh, from, a, from a space perspective. But of course, 100 moves later, that, that stone in move 37 stone, that black stone, happened to be in the perfect position to decide the match um, uh, 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 and decide the fight that was spilling out from the bottom left. So it's almost like AlphaGo presently put it there for 100 moves later for it to be in the perfect um, position. So it's these creative strategies that I think, and creativity in some ways, and just want to unpack that slightly, uh, that I think is one of the promises of these learning systems. Like the, the, the point is that they may be able to um, actually solve, come up with solutions to problems that we ourselves don't know how to. And... Um, and with expert systems, of course, this is not possible because you can only um, program directly a solution that you already know yourself how to, um, to solve. So you're sort of inherently limited with expert systems to uh, 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 solutions that experts, other experts, uh, know how to do. So I think in terms of creativity, we can think of three different types of levels of creativity, um, at least three. This may be something interesting for us to discuss. I think you can think of um, the lowest level or the least, the sort of most mundane creativity as being interpolation to kind of averaging things together. So you imagine you show a system a million cats, pictures of cats, and then you say, come up with an average uh, of all of those pictures. You know, that will be a novel cat. It won't be something in that's, that's exactly the same as any of those other million cats, but it's just a sort of simple averaging process. Then you have like extrapolation, which I think AlphaGo has shown, which is. Um, Given all of human knowledge about Go, then it then plays 10 million games of Go against itself, or at least AlphaGo Zero, the, 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 the successor version of AlphaGo did. And then it discovers new, um, kind of it can extrapolate new strategies never seen before, not in its training corpus. Um, but then there's still one level of creativity to go, I would say, which I'm calling invention or out-of-the-box thinking, which is, can, could these systems actually invent Go, right? So not just a new Go strategy, but actually invent Go or invent chess. Um, and, so, and our systems today still can't do that. But I don't think there's anything magical about that level of creativity. Maybe you can call that true creativity. I think it's still a systematic process that can be uh, uh, um, probably modeled by these systems. Um, I just think one thing that's holding them back is that we don't really know how to express um, that demand to a system in a way that it could understand. If I was going to um, get a, a computer system to design a game like Go, uh, I would say something like, you know, in, invent a game that only takes five minutes to learn, but many lifetimes to master, is aesthetically beautiful, can be completed in, in, in 10 hours of, you know, play, so it fits into a human day. These kinds of things is what I would kind of give as instructions, and then I'd hope it would come up with something like Go. But there's no real way for our current systems, at least, to sort of take on board such abstract uh, conceptual instructions and do something with that. But I think, you know, maybe that's kind of within reach now. So how does the self-play system work? And I'm just going to combine together 
um, uh, actually a range of systems together, AlphaGo, AlphaGo Zero, Alpha Zero, and even our more recent thing, Mu Zero. So Alpha Zero was our uh, a program that ended up could end up playing any two-player game to um, uh, better than sort of world champion level. And it's a very simple process if you break down this self-play idea, which I think is still something um, worth considering in the, in the generative uh, AI space too, actually, the analogous of this. I don't think it's been used yet. But what we did here is we started with V1 of, let's call it AlphaGo and, or AlphaZero, and it starts off playing randomly whatever game it is you've given it to play. It doesn't know, it doesn't know anything about strategies or anything. So it's just playing purely randomly. And you play 100,000 games like that, and then you generate your, your V1 data set. And you use that data set to train a V2. And what the V2 is trying to do is predict what sorts of moves are likely in, posi- in, in certain positions, and also who is, ends up winning the game uh, from that position, uh, and what's the probability uh, chance of either side winning from that position. So that's the two jobs of the network, to try and kind of model what the game uh, space is like. So then you, you train up V2. You then have a face-off match, a 100-game match of V1 versus V2. And um, you see you have some kind of threshold. In our case, we set a 55% win rate threshold, where if V2 beats V1 by above that threshold, you assume that it is significantly uh, uh, better. And then you replace the master system, the, the generator system, with that new V2 system now. And you go around, of course, iterating this round. So now we play another 100,000 games with V2, so it's slightly stronger. So that means the generated data is slightly better quality. And then you use that to train V3, which is, of course, then a slightly better system. And then you face off against V2 and you continue. Now, obviously, if V3 doesn't beat V2, then uh, you continue to generate more data, another 100,000 games with V2. So then now you have 200,000 games uh, to train a new V3. Right? And eventually, your V3 will beat V2. And if you do this 17 times for Alpha, Alpha Go Zero, you go from playing completely randomly to being uh, stronger than the world champion in just 17 epochs, which can be done in, you know, in a matter of hours. So this is a very um, powerful system. And uh, what's really going on if you step back is that it's, it's basically um, you're creating a model to uh, model, for example, Go, and the, and the dynamics of Go and the strategies of Go and the likely um, positions. And uh, that allows you to do tree search on top, but do it in a tractable way. So instead of having to explore all possibilities, like in gray here, like that should be intractable, you actually use the model to narrow down your search uh, to just the most reasonable um, uh, uh, options. Um, and then that allows you in a certain amount of constant thinking time to actually find a near optimal or very, very strong uh, actual uh, uh, line that you want to play and actual move you want to play here shown in pink. So I'm going to come back to this at the end because I think this is a very general way of thinking about um, AI and, the, and the, um, the idea of coming up with a solution to a problem. So we've been very fortunate over the last decade. We've been part of um, kind of creating many big breakthroughs um, in all sorts of different games, all of them kind of landmark uh, uh, results. The Atari one, the AlphaGo one I mentioned, AlphaZero, I just talked about generalizing that to every two-player game. And then finally, AlphaStar, which was our uh, um, program to uh, uh, beat Grandmasters players at StarCraft II, which is the most complex real-time strategy game, computer game. Um, and it has extra challenges over board games of it being partially observable. Uh, it needs things like long-term planning. So it's complex in, 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 in more challenging ways than a board game. Um, and so this was all of our work in, in games. Now, of course, although I love games, always have done playing them, designing them, using them for training for AI. Um, I sort of use games in every way possible. But they've always, although it's been very fun to do that, um, it's always been a kind of means to an end, not an end in itself, right? The end was never to uh, just win at Go or win at, um, win at StarCraft. It was to build, it was to use games as a convenient proxy to test out our algorithmic ideas so that we could apply them to important real-world problems. So that's what has been so exciting for me in the last couple of years, I would say, is that um, that first 10 years was really about building the foundation, the building blocks of what we see today in the modern uh, AI industry. Um, but uh, I, I, as of a couple, two, three years ago, I felt that um, the time was right. Actually, we had powerful enough, sophisticated enough algorithms 
that we could now start really tackling some very challenging problems, both in industry, you know, through our partners at Google and, and pretty much every product that you use at Google now has some form of DeepMind technology in it. But obviously, excitingly, going back to the mission statement and, and, and my particular passion of using AI for scientific discovery itself. So I'm going to go through um, probably our biggest and the, the result I find I'm most proud of of us uh, so far, which is our AlphaFold program. Um, many of you maybe will have heard about that, but for those of you who don't know um, what the protein folding problem is, it's this incredibly important problem in biology of um, basically predicting the 3D structure of a protein directly from its amino acid sequence. It's one-dimensional sequence. You can think of it as a bit like a genetic sequence for the protein. and um, and proteins are the workhorses of biology, the workhorses of life. Every function in your body, every function in life pretty much depends on proteins. And, um, and the function the protein does in, the, in your body is um, very dependent on uh, the 3D structure that it ends up folding into. So, um, of course, knowing the structure then can be really important for things like drug discovery and understanding disease. But uh, unfortunately, it, it takes, you know, order of three, four, many years can take to even experimentally determine one structure, um, depending on the difficulty of the protein to crystallize and so on. Uh, and in fact, um, uh, uh, my biologist friends used to always tell me, you know, the rule of thumb is that uh, you, take, you can take one whole PhD student, their whole PhD, to, to basically determine the structure of one protein. Of course, let, um, uh, Christian and Fienzen, uh, uh, uh famously said in his Nobel acceptance speech in 1972 that this should be possible, like determining the 3D structural protein should be determined, fully determined by the amino acid sequence. So this protein folding problem should be solvable in theory. But of course, he didn't say how. It's a bit like Fermat's last theorem. I'll just write it in the margin. And then 50 years of toil later, people are still, you know, trying to figure out why this would be, you know, should be the case. So it's been literally a 50-year-old grand challenge in biology. Um, I found out about it actually as an undergrad. Um, at Cambridge in the, in the late 90s, um, a couple of my biologist friends were obsessed with this problem and really explained to me, well, first of all, what it was, but also how much uh, additional research it would unlock if one could actually solve this problem. And that always stuck with me as something, and, and I tend to do this when I hear interesting things like that, I sort of file them away in a kind of metaphorical uh, little book of, of, of things to do. And and, and one day when, you know, this, I thought this would be a very suitable problem for, for AI. So, um, so that's, the, that's the question then. Can the protein structure prediction problem be solved computationally? Why is this such a hard problem? Well, again, um, you know, Leventhal, one of the uh, contemporaries of, of, um, of Van Fienzen, said, uh, had a, was sort of famously conjectured this paradox of, well, there's 10 to the 300 possible shapes an average protein can take. Um, you know, an average size protein, that's what he calculated, back of envelope. Uh, but somehow, obviously, nature spontaneously folds these uh, proteins in your body in, in milliseconds, you know, trillions of these proteins. So how is this possible? Um, you know, is the physics is somehow solving this in a very, you know, very tractable amount of time. So in a way, that should give you hope that there is some landscape to learn about. Maybe it's a quantum one, but there is some landscape that your um, AI system should be able to learn about in order to uh, solve this in, this problem in a tractable uh, timescale. Um, the other reason we picked this problem, apart from its uh, sort of uh, significance in terms of uh, uh, enabling many other things downstream, is that there's this fantastic competition called the CASP competition, which is a little bit like the Olympics of protein folding. And it runs every two years uh, and has done since 1994. So it's like 30 years in now. And it's, it's very rigorously run, uh, and it's to test the best computational systems every two years. And, what the, and the, the beauty of it is, is that um, what happens is experimentalists, when they know they're about to, they've just resolved a structure experimentally, but they haven't published it yet, they give it to the CAFS competition uh, to sort of be a blind test. And then you, you're supposed to give your prediction in, and then by the end of the competition, they publish their, the real structure, and obviously you can compare it then to the ground truth. But it's a, it's a double-blind experiment. You don't know who the competitors are, and you also don't know uh, what the real structures are. So it's a really clean experiment for testing computational systems. 
And um, before we came along with this, this was the this was the basically what had been going on in the field for the last decade before we got involved with AlphaFold. Um, we started AlphaFold in 2016, actually, um, uh, the day after we got back from Seoul and the AlphaGo match. Uh, this was our next big project, and you can see here this is a this is a bar chart of the winning scores of the top team in each of the uh, uh, CAS competitions going back to 2006, so every two years. And uh, on the y-axis, you can see uh, the score that they, they, they rated is called GDT. But um, you can sort of think of it as about uh, roughly as a percentage accuracy of how many of the residues, the amino acids, did you get within um, a, a tolerance of the correct ground truth position, right? And that tolerance is, 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 is a couple of angstrom. So, um, so, they, that's, so you can see the, the winning teams for, for a decade we're only getting about 30 to 40% uh, of those, those correct, which is um, and it, on the hardest category, I should say, so free modeling category where there aren't templates or other things that you can rely on that are known, so that you, they're truly unknown uh, from their sequence. Um, and essentially, this is, this, is not, this is useless for experimentalists, right? It's just, it's just not nowhere near accurate enough. It's, and many area parts of the structures would be kind of completely random. And what we were told is that in order for this, by the organizers, in order for this problem to be considered to be solved, you would have to get prediction, uh, your prediction would have to be accurate to within the width of an atom. So that's less than one angstrom error. And, um, and, and you'd have to do it on over 90% of the, of the residues. So you're looking for a kind of 90, uh, roughly a 90 GDT score uh, for, for that to be of use to an experimentalist. And one way to think about that is if you crystallized a protein twice um, with two different, in two different labs um, and uh, you tested it, and then you compared the two structures you got experimentally, there would be some disagreement between those two experimental structures, right? So there's no perfect ground truth in a sense. So there's still, there's, there would be experimental disagreement to, to that fidelity. So you want to get within that bound, uh, then, then you know, you're starting to become really useful potentially. So we entered in 2018 after a couple of years of work uh, with AlphaFold 1 that won the competition by a huge margin. We, we improved over uh, previous you know, scores by like almost 50%, getting close to 60 GDT. People were amazed. It was the first time, um, I would say, cutting-edge ML techniques had been used uh, as the core of a, of a, of a protein folding system, uh, and it had this huge uh, uh, improvement um, straight out of the box. But the problem was, is obviously we wanted to get to this, to this uh, uh, 90 GDT or less than one angstrom error. And uh, we managed to do that with AlphaFold 2. But actually, we had to go through a whole re-architecting using the ideas we, and, and experience we'd learned from AlphaFold 1. But it needed, um, it needed a, a completely different approach in the end and different architecture in order for uh, AlphaFold 2 to work and to, for us to crack that, including uh, one of the important innovations was actually building some physics constraints and chemical constraints into the network, uh, into the properties of the network. So you didn't have to learn things like, you know, van der Waals forces and overlapping atoms shouldn't be atoms shouldn't be overlapping and things like that and bond angles. We actually solved that in a sort of a expert system way, but then without harming the learning. So it's actually I don't know. There's many other examples of systems that have combined sort of prior knowledge, one could say, prior domain knowledge in that way, hand handcrafted with a learning system, because usually that interferes with the, with the learning system. So this was obviously amazing. We released this in 2020. The results came out in, the competition was in the summer of 2020. The results came out in, in, in uh, the end of 2020. And then the organizers of the competition, this amazing guy called John Malt, who has run the comp, founded the competition, run it for 30 years, uh, was almost in tears sort of declaring that uh, uh, the problem had been solved. And obviously, looking back at 2016, and I was talking to him about this, given the trajectory, he was despairing of the fact that it would ever be solved in, in his lifetime. So that was fantastic. Here's an example of really, I mean, proteins are super beautiful once you actually get into them. They're little bio nanomachines, they're incredible. I mean, once I started really looking to this back in 2016, I was very intricately involved in this project. Um, you know, they, they, they're exquisite bi uh, biological nanoscale machines. And uh, it's kind of amazing that, that this complex dance can work in our bodies and give, you know, gives birth to life, really. Um, and so here's one really complex protein. 
um, that, that, and you can see AlphaFold actually iteratively, iteratively gets there's some recycling processes and it goes through the network several times and then eventually gets to the, to the final shape, which you can compare is very similar. Um, the green and blue, the green's the ground truth and the blue is the prediction and they're almost uh, overlapping for something as complex as this. So what did we go on and do then? We, we decided to that the best way to get the maximum impact from AlphaFold in, in the world and the maximum benefit for humanity was to publish the methods, open source the code. And then furthermore, we sort of realized um, this is the Christmas of 2020 now. We had a pretty productive sort of uh, 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 2020 and, 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 and lockdown was that we decided actually, you know, how would we give this to the world? And the normal way you normally do this is you normally provide a service on a server and people um, give you their amino acid sequences. And then, you know, a few days later, you, you send back to them, you email back to them the, the predictor structure. Uh, and that's the normal way things were done. But because AlphaFold was so fast and also so accurate, we just decided we would just generate all proteins known to science. So actually over that Christmas, we did the whole human proteome, you know, uh, over, over the Christmas holidays. Uh, and then we did 20 model organisms, um, and the most important ones for, for research uh, uh, and, and things like plant science and so on, um, important crops. Um, and then uh, we did every protein um, uh, known to science to all 200 million. And this is really important because in humans, um, you know, the coverage is around, uh, I think it was around, uh, you know, 17, 18% of the that had been found experimentally. And we more than doubled that with, with high accuracy uh, uh, predictions. But for other, in other organisms, uh, let's take plants like, you know, wheat or rice, very important uh, crop species, uh, you know, less than 1% are, are was known, um, partly because they're, their, their genomes are much bigger um, for, for evolutionary reasons, but also there's just a lot less um, uh, funding and a lot less uh, experimental work done on those, on those uh, types of organisms. So is it actually even differentially useful to people like um, plant scientists? So that's been amazing to see. And then once we've done that, obviously we wanted to put that on some kind of database. We thought about doing our own one, but actually we realized that it would be much better to just plug into the main vein of what biologists use every day. And, uh, and there's all sorts of amazing databases biologists have created, uh, and uh, one called Uniprot. Uh, obviously, there's P the PDB itself that has all the crystalline structures in it that we learned from, 150,000 structures uh, that have been accumulated over the, the last uh, 40, 50 years. Um, and we teamed up with MBOEBI, European Bioinformatics Institute, uh, just up the road from us in Cambridge in the UK. And uh, they already host some of the world's best um, uh, uh, databases, and uh, we very quickly had an amazing collaboration with them over two or three months to create a new database and host it and, uh, uh, and put all the AlphaFold predictions uh, onto that database and also plug it in to all the other uh, databases, um, genetics databases and other things that are other ways where you might come to find the, the structure that you're looking for. So that's been amazing. And then on the safety and ethics side, of course, we take this very seriously. We always have done. I'm going to talk a little bit about that towards the end. Um, we actually consulted over 30 experts in the area from obviously biologists, but also from pharma and biosecurity and even human rights to just make sure that what we were releasing uh, uh, wasn't uh, dangerous in some way or, and the benefits would certainly outweigh any of the risks uh, involved. And they all came back unanimously is saying that they thought that the benefits far outweighed uh, any, any potential risks. And then what has AlphaVolt been used for over the last, um, I guess, 18 months, nearly two years now? An incredible plethora of things. Uh, if you're interested, I, I'd encourage you to go to our unfolded.deepmind.com uh, website, which has, we're collecting sort of um, uh, use cases of from, from fantastic scientists around the world who've used it and told us, contacted us and told us um, how, how transformative it has been for them. And, uh, and if any of you are biologists in the audience, and I know some of you are, you know, and if you've been using it, we'd love to hear from you what you've been using it for. But here's just some examples of, you know, um, uh, John McGeehan and team from Portsmouth are using it to um, design plastic eating enzymes uh, to, to deal with plastic pollution in the oceans, people using it for antibiotic resistance. Uh, it was used to help determine the, the nuclear pore complex, the big, one of the biggest proteins in the body that, uh, that, that governs a kind of gateway to let nutrients in and out of the, of the cell nucleus. 
um, uh, uh, that was a combination of experimental data and alpha fold predictions. Um, Jennifer Dowden has been using it in her Institute for Crop Sustainability, improving crop sustainability in the face of climate change, malaria vaccines. And then most recently, I was pleased to see Feng Zhang at the Broad Institute uh, using it uh, for, to create a sort of molecular syringe as a new drug, dis- drug delivery mechanism, um, which is fantastic in his recent uh, Nature paper. So it's been really amazing to see and actually more than we could have dreamed of. And uh, just, you know, 18 months in, we've had a million researchers use the alpha, use AlphaFold and the predictions AlphaFold's made. We think that's pretty much almost every biologist in the world now, from almost every country. And it's already been cited 10,000 times already uh, in just 18 months, the, uh, the, uh, the paper, the methods paper. And uh, obviously got some nice accolades from science and from nature as well. So what, what, what's my kind of, um, uh, uh, you know, all these things are happening and like every year something amazing is happening and I'm trying to sort of make sense of this all, you know, while being in the middle of it and, and, and it's, and if anything, you know, accelerating the pace of progress. And it's kind of interesting. There's a few thing takeaways that I maybe want to leave you with, which is, so first of all, there's this notion I'm, I'm kind of been saying and thinking about of science at digital speed. And what do I mean by that? I mean, um, science at this sort of technology speed. So being able to do science at what we normally think of as, 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 as digital, te- digital technology speed. And I think AlphaFold is maybe the first example of that. And, and I think is, but, but I think it's just going to be the first of many. And, and I think um, AlphaFold is a sort of science of digital speed in two ways. One is that obviously it can fold the proteins in you know, milliseconds. Uh, instead of taking years of experimental work, right? So 200 million proteins, I mean, this is obviously just a funny back of envelope rule of thumb, but you times that by a PhD time of five years, that's like a billion years of PhD time, right? By some measure that has been done in, in a year. Of course, there's, you know, they're not all perfectly accurate and et cetera, so we still need both experiments as well, but that has to be helpful, right? And then the second way it's at digital speed is the f- speed at which it can get disseminated. The solution can be used by actual biologists, drug discovery people, all of pharma, all of that. Now, normally, as I understand it, you know, you may invent some incredible new technique, biological technique. It's 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 a huge breakthrough, but it still might take a decade for that to flow through into the lab. Everyone has to be trained on it. Maybe new equipment has to be built. People have to think about how to use it. Here, it's just a database. You literally do a keyword lookup, and it's there, right? It's so for everyone in any country with or just with a, just like a Google search. So, so because it's digital in nature, the solution, it can also be disseminated in, in, in the way we normally think about apps and other digital uh, devices and, and services. So I think that's an interesting concept, and maybe other people can think of other examples, but I, I can't. And I feel like this is going to be more, uh, I, I'm really excited about the next few years and seeing uh, this happen more and more in many other branches of science. Another observation I have is I think we're maybe, uh, uh, you know, at the dawn of a new era of what I like to call dig- digital biology. So my thinking is, and why we, you know, even embarked on something like AlphaFold is that I feel like biology at its most fundamental level can be thought of as an information processing system in some sense. Obviously, it's a phenomenally complex one and an emergent one. So that brings huge complexity. And I think that's why mathematics, you know, humans doing mathematical models of these things, whilst of course, can be very useful. I think they're going to be. It's difficult for for maths to fully describe um, like a cell. You know, I'm not sure we're going to ever discover Newton's laws of motion for a cell. It's just too emergent, too complex. And I think that's why AI might be the perfect solution to that type of regime. So, I, you know, I think of maths and how well it describes physics, uh, physics phenomena. I think AI could be the right description language for biology. And I feel, I hope. AlphaFold is a proof of concept, and I hope that it, we, when we look back on it, it's actually not just AlphaFold itself being useful, um, but it heralds the dawn of a new era of digital biology. And I've actually, we've actually spun out a new alphabet company called Isomorphic Labs, a sister company to DeepMind, to try and re- take these technologies further in biochemistry space and improve AlphaFold further and other things to reimagine the drug discovery process from first principles using AI and computational techniques. Can you do the search in mostly in silico and then leave, valid, leave, the, leave the wet lab work to the validation step? That would be the kind of dream. So um, 
So then, you know, basically building on that and, and, and stepping even further back then, what have we done when I look at the body of work that we've done? What, what is it that these things have in common? And I think the essence of what our systems are doing is we're effectively trying to find an optimal solution in some kind of enormous combinatorial space. I think that's a very general description of problems, scientific problems, but other problems too. Um, and then what we've done with from AlphaGo onwards to AlphaFold is effectively learn a model of that environment, the dynamics of that environment, the, the, the manifold of that environment, basically, and the context. And um, you, we've learned that from data or from simulated data. Ideally, you have both in many cases. So in games, obviously, we have this, it's effectively simulated data. Um, and then what you do is you take that model and hopefully, it doesn't have to be perfect, that model, but it has to be better than chance, of course. And then you use that model to guide a, a, a search uh, process according to some objective function. Right? And if it's a game, then you're trying to win or maximize the score. But if it's something like you know, a biological problem, chemistry problem, maybe you're trying to minimize the free energy, something like that. As long as you can express that objective function, uh, that should work. And I think this basically turns out to be a very general solution. I think this is a general way to think about a lot of problems. I'm not saying every problem can fit into that. I mean, maybe, but, but, but a lot of problems. And uh, when you look at things in this, with this lens, you start realizing that that problem can actually be made to fit to this type of solution. And I'll give you an example from drug discovery, um, which is what we're trying to do at Isomorphic, is so this is the tree I showed you earlier, finding the best go move, right? So each node here is a go position, and then each, um, each edge is a go move. And you're trying to, you know, intractable space, 10 to the 170, and you're trying to find a near optimal uh, or close to optimal uh, uh, go move and go strategy. Well, what happens if we just change those nodes to chemical compounds, right? And now we're in chemistry space and, uh, and you know, you start with some fragment or something at the top, and then you've got to decide what you're going to add to that in some sort of generative process. Um, and now you're basically exploring through chemistry space, with, but obviously you need an underlying model of, of biochemistry, uh, which is something we're building. Uh, and then in theory, you could search uh, for, for optimal compounds with optimal properties um, that you're looking for, like you no know, side effects, all of these solubility, all of these properties, admet properties, they're called in drug discovery, um, and do it uh, in the same way, in the same tractable, tractable way we did with Go. And obviously, if this is true, if this works, even to some degree, it would be revolutionary, I think, for drug discovery process. So um, I'm going to sort of come to the end now of like, well, we've had sort of a golden couple of years in some sense with for AI for science. We've had been lucky enough to have many nature and science papers published in all sorts of domains. So from quantum chemistry, uh, better, better DFT functions to approximate Schrodinger's equation, um, pure mathematics, we solved some important conjectures in topology with collaborating with some brilliant uh, mathematicians. Um, we found work in on fusion reactors with EPFL. Uh, on their test fusion reactor, controlling the plasma in real time in their fusion reactors and being able to hold the plasma uh, safely in place for, uh, uh, for arbitrary amounts of time, um, being able to predict uh, rainfall uh, uh, many hours ahead uh, more accurately than current uh, meteorological uh, models. So, I mean, I just showed that I could have had several more slides of this. I just, just, but this is what should happen if you're building a general uh, algorithmic solution to things, right? You should be able to apply it to a kind of mind-blowing a number of different uh, spaces. Um, and in general, we usually, the, our, we have a whole approach of how to do this too. We, uh, you know, how do we find a problem that's interesting? How do we find a problem that fits uh, 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 what I just mentioned? And then we usually try and find one of the world's best experts in, in this area to collaborate with, right? And then um, uh, and really make sure we're actually answering a problem that they actually care about. Right? It's very actually quite difficult to do that, actually articulate what the right problem is, um, unless you get really deep with a domain expert uh, uh, on that. Um, and so we, we, you know, we've, we've been lucky to collaborate with many, many fantastic scientists on, and mathematicians on all these problems. And then in applications, there's a ton of those too. If I mentioned some of those earlier, we, we saved one of the early things we did at Google was saving about 30% of the cooling energy used to cool the massive data centers at Google. Uh, so there's a huge energy saving and 
we're starting to explore doing that across actual whole power grids. Um, WaveNet, our most realistic text-to-speech system that everyone uses, a variation of that, one of the first auto-aggressive models uh, uh, um, that we did, Erin van der Oord, led that work at DeepMind way back. And is now the basis of all modern text-to-speech systems. So pretty much any system that you're talking to and their very realistic voices that come back are based on uh, uh, this work. Um, we compress YouTube videos down by 4%, uh, or, you know, improve recommendation systems um, across the board, really. A huge amount of impact there on applications too. Then, of course, there's large models, um, all the rage right now. Uh, we've done a ton of work in this area. Uh, um, just pick, to pick a few things out is Chinchilla, uh, one of our sort of famous results that looking at the scaling laws of um, large language models um, and actually showing that um, find the important finding that they're, they're kind of undertrained or they were undertrained back a, back a couple of years ago. AlphaCode, our system that can program at um, in competitive programming competitions, program at median human programmer level, and that's getting better all the time. Flamingo, our system to uh, describe what's happening in visual images. And then Gato, probably one of our most, most general agents out there so far. It's a, you can think of it as an arbitrary token-to-token -token translator, uh, and it doesn't care what those tokens are, right? They don't have to be words, they don't have to be images, they could be anything, it could also be actions, for example, like to control a robot. So that same system, Gato, can, can do pretty much all the things I've showed you uh, earlier on in this talk. Uh, or, or, and then and more besides things like controlling uh, robot arms and things like that, all with the same system. We pioneered a lot of stuff in large language models ourselves. We've been testing them for years now. Um, our bigger systems are called Gopher and Chinchilla, and there's some, some newer ones. But we've been using them to do a lot of research into safety of these systems. How can we make sure they, they do rule adherence? Um, we pioneered areas like RLHF now that are becoming huge uh, we sort of published the first paper in that back in 2017, tension retrieval, memory, all of these things uh, are important advances that need to be included into our large models. And uh, many people are now experimenting with these things. And my view is currently that scale is incredibly important. Like, obviously, we have to continue uh, on those scaling laws and adding more compute and more data is clearly helping. Um, maybe we're starting to see some diminishing returns now on that. Um, depends on how you look at it. Um, and I, but my view is that these large pre-trained models have to be a necessary, but they're probably not sufficient in themselves uh, component of AGI. That's my current position. Um, but you know, I'm 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 not highly confident on that. There is there is definitely plausible that they might be sufficient. Um, but my guess, my best guess, would be that they're clearly necessary, but not sufficient in on on their own. And I think some of the areas we need more innovations on are uh, areas like grounding and factuality. Of course, we all know about the hallucinations of these systems, and there's many ways to try and address that. Planning is missing, memory and reasoning, uh, and quite a few other things besides, I think. And we're working on all those topics uh, very hard now. Um, and our, our best chatbot is, uh, 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 is called Sparrow internally. We published a paper on that just over a year ago. We've been improving it since. And really for us, this is a deep exploration into how we can build a dialogue agent to be uh, helpful more of the time, correct more of the time, and harmless. So they're designed to answer questions with responses that are useful and evidence-based. And it uses um, search and retrieval uh, to partly fact check and to, to ground it. Um, and it's pretty cool. The results we're getting on that, which we'll be talking about more soon, is um, maybe an order of magnitude more accurate and grounded than, than uh, other systems out there, um, sort of less than 1% uh, 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 um, errors, uh, even under adversarial testing. Um, so it's pretty cool. And but we want, but in the moment, there's a little bit of a trade-off in the sense that if you want things to be more accurate and safe, they tend to be a little bit less fun and engaging to, uh, to interact with, right? But ideally, you want the best of both worlds. And that's what we're working on right now. But it's actually a little bit difficult. It's a bit of like a Pareto frontier at the moment. If you, if you make it more uh, rule adherence, more strict and more polite and, and those things um, uh, and, and refuse to answer difficult questions and stuff like that, obviously it impacts um, how engaging uh, that's going to be. So that's an interesting um, uh, uh, dichotomy that we're seeing at the moment and we're trying to solve. So talking about uh, ethics and, and responsibility, I think. Um, 
you know, AI has incredible potential to help with humanity's greatest challenges. Uh, that's why I've worked on AI my entire career, my entire life. Obviously, I think that's going to come about in a big way through advancing science. Um, but of course, uh, these are dual-use technologies. We've always known that from the beginning of DeepMind. We've had an ethics charter from the very start of DeepMind. Um, that's now part of Google's AI principles. Um, so, you know, we help to draft those. So, and those are publicly available. And so I think AI has to be deployed and used and built responsibly and safely and, and to ensure that it's used for the benefit of everyone. That's obviously, I know, a big part of what uh, HAI and the people here are thinking about. Um, and it's been, you know, central and core to us from the start. And people like Fei Fei will know about that. We've been discussing these things for many, many years. Um, and we continue to try and be a sort of thought leader and, and to provide thought leadership on these topics of AI strategy, uh, uh, coordinating, uh, uh, um, uh, safety work, risks, ethics, and and also engaging and 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 uh, with the wider community to to get them up to speed with what is sometimes a bewilderingly fast pace. Well, definitely is bewilderingly fast pace of of innovations and advances. So I'll just finish then by saying, you know, approach to AGI. My, my view is that we are approaching a, an absolutely critical moment in human history. That might sound a bit grand, but I, I really don't think that is overstating the, 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 the where we are. I think it could be an incredible moment, um, but it's also a, a risky moment uh, in human history. And my advice would be, and I get asked about this all the time, is I, I think we should not move fast and break things, right? The, the typical value mantra of move fast and break things. It's obviously extraordinarily uh, effective. It's created, you know, the modern Silicon Valley, this type. And there are, very, there are other variations on this same sentiment, right? Sort of, you know, uh, uh, break things and then you ask for forgiveness, you know, uh, later, right? Um, I don't think that's appropriate for something this powerful. Right. You can't, you can't necessarily specifically, it's not that you definitely don't move fast. I think you move at the sort of right speed. I'm not saying we move slow, but we definitely don't want to break things, um, uh, uh, um, you know, that we could have foreseen ahead of time. Right. And also, depending on how powerful the technology is, um, you know, it may not be possible to fix that afterwards. Um, so these unintended consequences. And I think we're seeing that with social media, right, more broadly construed. Now we're starting to understand you know, at the scale that it's at now, there are these unintended uh, consequences that can be pretty bad. Um, and I think we should learn from that and, and do it differently this time uh, with AI, which I think will be far more um, impactful um, uh, than, than social media has been, which has already been obviously hugely impactful. So what should we do then? Well, I would advocate, well, fortunately, we already have a way of doing this, the scientific method. Uh, and I think we should invoke that here on an organizational level uh, as a community and as an industry. And that involves, you know, these, these typical aspects of the scientific method, thoughtful deliberation and foresight where possible, um, hypothesis generation with rigorous testing, if not out in the wild necessarily, carefully controlled conditions and control conditions, um, detailed analysis. I don't think there's enough analysis techniques out there. I think that's something we need to do a lot more research on as, a, as an industry and community. Update based on empirical data, ideally with external review. And the aim of all of this is to gain a better understanding of your systems before, um, before you, you, know, you deploy them at scale um, and then find out something you know, isn't right. And of course, this, we're never gonna, this is not a question about getting things perfect. It's not possible. Right. You do have to do some empirical testing in the wild, but we should be thoughtful about that. Right? We can do better than just dumping it out into the world and hoping for the best and then seeing what happens. I think we can, um, we, if we use the scientific method, we can get a lot, maybe 90% of the way of understanding something. And then there's just sort of, it narrows the, the things that could you know, maybe go wrong or the unforeseen things. So, I would say, you know, as we approach AGI, when, you know, maybe we're getting close, pretty close to it now, we need to treat it with the respect and the sort of precautionary principle that a technology of this potential uh, demands. Um, so my view is we kind of need to be bold and responsible. So, um, you know, both of those things uh, together. So I'll just end by saying, you know, I think if we get this right, and, and this has always been my hope, I think AGI from the point of view as a scientist, you know, it could be the ultimate general purpose tool to help us understand the universe, much like maybe the Hubble telescope has helped us understand the cosmos. Thank you.
Thank you, Demis. You know, we get to see each other quite often, but yeah. still love, love listening to your talks, <laughs> both online or offline. So I think uh, especially with um, lots of students here, I think we have a lot of questions. So we do have microphones, I think, on the on the side, but I'll start with, uh, with a couple of questions and uh, we'll open it to the audience. So, um, you know, you wear many hats, right? You're your founder and uh, CEO of DeepMind. You're really a world thought leader in AI. Uh, you're a gamer all your life. I think in your heart's heart, you're a scientist. <laughs> I say this partially because I am too. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I'm going to ask you a question um, to just begin with as scientist to scientist. Really not thinking about all your slides, hmm. what excites you the most in terms of a scientific question today? I, I think you're right about my, my, my heart is a scientist. And then there are these other things I do to enable that science, right? I'm an entrepreneur because I thought that was the fastest way to get the scientific uh, mission going. Uh, even teaming up with Google was to get the compute power so I could push the mission faster. Um, I think for scientifically, so the thing I'm most excited about in applications is things like AlphaFold, right? And more things like that, the drug discovery. I want to make that happen. I think we can revolutionize human health and disease and, and things like sustainability. All of the projects I've picked are in these key areas. So that's one thing. But maybe in a kind of even more scientific way, what I'm excited about is I've always thought this journey that we're on, you know, that we're currently on and making a lot of progress now with AI would reveal a lot about the human condition. Because I've always been fascinated, and one reason I did a neuroscience PhD is I'm fascinated by the brain, our brains, right? How are we coming up? And I've been fascinated about that through games because of playing chess when I was a kid and for the England junior teams and so on. And it was, I was trying to improve my own thought processes. So that's what got me starting thinking about thinking, how are we coming up with these ideas? And why is my brain making this mistake? Why can't I stop it from doing that? And then, of course, you know, you read philosophy and maybe too many science fiction books I read when I was a kid. And you start thinking about like, what is all the big questions, you know, really consciousness, creativity, dreaming. Um, what, what are all of these things? And neuroscience can go some way to explain that. And I tried that very far. And then probably there are many neuroscientists in the room. But I think it'd probably take us another 50, 100 years to get to the bottom of all of that. And in some cases, maybe not, because what do we have as a comparator, you know, like how can you dissociate intelligence from consciousness and things like that. But actually, I, I always thought attempting to build AI in this way, uh, a general learning system that learned and was general, um, and then seeing, of course, we can, you know, that's a, it's an engineering science AI, right? You build the artifact, and then you can use uh, analysis techniques to pull it apart, like we do in natural sciences. And then comparing that to the human mind, I think that will actually ultimately give us these answers to the to the deepest questions we've wondered since the classical Greeks or before. Um, and I think it's the and I think it's a tool in many ways as a as a comparator, but also it could help us with neuroscience too. I mean of course neuroscience is one of the sciences I'm thinking that AI could help with. And a lot of people are using AI for analysis, but we could also do it for models and other things. So that maybe is the thing I'm most excited about is finding out these deep questions, ultimately the nature of reality with with our AI system. Help. So after all these years from doing from energy to drugs to games, it is still the, the science, the brain, the intelligence that's still... Uh... The brain intelligence and maybe physics, you know, like the, the, the nature of reality, like what's going on here? I just find it so fascinating, always have. And I think for me, I think most people, I mean, physics was my favorite subject at school, right? And I read what Steven Weinberg's book, Feynman, you know, Dreams of Final Theory. Feynman was my favorite scientist of a recent scientist. Roger Penrose. Physicist. Roger Penrose. I've had many chats with him about, about uh, consciousness, and we disagree on most things, actually, but it's, it's, uh, it's always fun talking to him. And, um, but then I just thought, you know, actually, it'd be better to build a tool that could help us maybe understand all of these big questions, physics questions, the nature of reality, ultimately. And so, um, and on the way, have this incredible engineering uh, uh, project as well. So it just, for me, it was the most fascinating project one could ever do. 
you know, we almost become lab mates. As a physics undergrad, I got into Poggio's yeah. lab, oh, right. but I went to his student's lab at Caltech. So oh, you nearly, nearly overlap there. Okay. Okay. Oh, we oh, almost yeah. become lab mates. Yeah. <laughs> um, so physics, neuroscience, we share. Actually, um, do you think what you're building will eventually be able to generate the set of Newtonian laws of intelligence for us? Um, I think to the extent that there might be Newtonian laws, I don't see why not. But I actually think we'll be able to use it to understand a new set of Newtonian laws for physics, you know, like what is going on with quantum mechanics and quantum behavior and all these things. I don't see why that would be not tractable at some point with our system. I want to follow up on that because I was listening to your talk and this incredible engineering feat as well as, um, you know, just uh, mathematical feat in terms of AI, in terms of scientific discovery. and. Uh, you are sitting here in the headquarter of Human Centered AI, yes. so I have to ask you, what is humans' role in scientific discovery going forward? Yeah, well, there's um, this next period I think is very exciting. Next period meaning, you know, next decade or two, let's say. Um, hard to say exactly where. I think the AI systems are going to do a lot of the drudgery, pattern matching, um, searching literature, a lot of this sort of stuff, right? You could imagine a science assistant uh, language model. I mean, we're, we're you know we're, we're we're thinking you know we're working on these kind of things where they have to be a lot more accurate than they are now. Right now, they halluc- I'm sure you've all tried it. They just hallucinate likely paper titles and papers, right? And they don't really exist. They sounded convincing. Yeah, they sound very <laughs> convincing. Um, but you know, you once you fix all those problems, it could be pretty amazing. Um, and I think that. Wait, are you saying? that the human roles are like prompt engineers? No, I think (laughs) coming up with, it's always the classical thing of like actually defining the right question to ask. That's the hardest thing in science, right? These systems can't do that. That's the invention bit of AlphaGo I was talking about, right? Inventing Go. Okay, how are you going to do, you can come up with a Go move, but it's not, not, you know, we're not even got line of sight how it's going to invent Go or something as amazing as Go or as amazing as chess. Right now, I don't think it's impossible. So I'm not in the camp of like we need some quantum, you know, thing to do it or whatever. Like you know, maybe someone like Penrose would argue, right? But it's given we're talking about Penrose. But so I think a Turing machine can do it. And and I I often see my role in this way. You know, and you've got Penrose in my head now because um, I've had many interesting debates with him. I see myself as Turing's champion, right? Because I think that Turing machines and class, i.e. classical computers can do a lot more than we thought they could. And I think. That is what AlphaFold is showing in AlphaGo is these are massive combinatorial spaces. I mean, proteins are quantum systems, right, down at at that level. Some people claim that there's MP hard, you know, all of these things, right? So, and somehow we we have, um, with AlphaFold, mimicked effectively a quantum system. We've modeled it and it's tractable. It's in P time. You get the answer back in milliseconds. So that's something pretty important now, I think. I'm thinking a lot about and talking to my you know, theoretical computer, you know, computer science friends about like, what does this mean for P equals MP and these kinds of things? And so I think, yeah, there's just a lot of, you know, complex questions here that we've got to, you know, try and tackle. Well, let's get Penrose out of your head. Yeah. At least Einstein said what you just said. I think in uh, the Nobel Museum, there's a quote by Einstein about much of science is asking the right questions. Yeah. Yeah, so this is, I think this, when, but not asking the right question isn't just the top level thing. It's sort of deciding what these systems should investigate, how we should investigate them, what kinds of experiments we should do, hypothesis generation. None of that is possible at the moment. Now, but maybe in a number of years' time, we will have more advanced systems that can do that. Then we're in a different stage. But right now, I think that this, this we should be incredibly useful for human scientists, I would think. So a little bit of a, a switch of topic because uh, you talk about DeepMind's uh, effort in LLMs at Stanford. We uh, call them foundation models. Yeah. Doesn't matter. It's yeah. all good. Um, we have a Center for Research of Foundation Models. Yeah. You're aware yeah. of our NLP faculty like Percy Leung and so on are leading that. Uh, one of the mission at uh, Stanford CRFM is uh, uh, pushing for norms. Mm. And you... You're one of, I remember back in like, feels like ages ago, yeah. 
you were talking about all these safety yeah. and norms. What do you think the norms should be right now in, as you call it, dangerous moment? Mm -hmm. and, and LLMs and foundation models are leading in terms of that. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, I would say it's risky moment, and we have to. It's 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 important what we do from here. I think as a community, as an industry, and as a society. Um, I feel like we need. There's, I mean, there's several things. There's 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 much more rigorous red teaming of these systems. We do a lot of that ourselves, but it'd be great to have a maybe a nonprofit body that does that, or you know, governmental body that does that. HAI or nonprofit could be, yeah, could be, <laughs> well be exactly. Um, I think we need to understand the systems better, so better analysis tools, interpretability needs to be advanced. Um, I think. Some of the stuff, things I mentioned for Sparrow, I think are, they're all safety features like rules adherence. Um, so one question is, can you get it to obey rule, the rules that you want? The next question is, even if you can do that, what rules should you put in? Right? But there are a lot of obvious things that should go in um, that we have, but there can be unintended consequences of, the, of that as well. So, um, yeah, I think there's a, there's a lot of, uh, I mean, there's, there needs to be analysis of, of uh, data creation and the type of data you're putting in. I don't think we've done enough on that. Like we try and fix it at the output with our, our LHF, but I think a lot of it would be good also if we, if we filtered um, incorrect things and inappropriate things from the inputs, um, uh, from the training data. So I think there's so many uh, things to be explored and done. And I think the problem is the capabilities are moving very fast and some of this other work, need, there needs to be more focus on some of this other work, safety and and analysis and those types of things. Do partnerships play a role? Yeah, I think so. I think we should we should be discussing that. I mean, we've offered our you know latest models to people like the Turing Institute in the UK. I mean, I think, and we we should talk about. I think we've also reached out to people here. Um, we've got to figure out way the right way to to interact like that, where maybe access to models can be given to uh, external uh, partners or collaborators and. And, and they can independently sort of investigate these things before before they're, they're they're put out into the wild. It's quite hard to do that because the problem is a lot of at the moment a lot of this work is very manual. You know, in terms of testing out all the edge cases of effectively an emerging system, it's quite difficult to get that unless you have millions of people using it. But then it's already out. So um, maybe we need to also come up with um, better automated testing of these things too. Right. I started my question asking you to wear your scientist hat. Yeah. I'm going to end my part of the question asking you to wear the hat of a, a world-leading AI thought leader. In the, you, you, you really talked about this risky moment a couple of times, more than a couple of times. Yeah. Going forward, the next, just say, 10 years-ish, it's hard to imagine the next week, yeah. piece of AI right now. Uh, what is... A couple of most important things you think as a society mm -hmm. in this AI revolution, we collectively should be working on that. Even the mighty deep mind mm -hmm. cannot work on yourself. Mm -hmm. Well, look, I think there are, I mean, there's many complicated things I think society needs to debate and discuss. For example, you know, the values these systems should have. The, the rules you want, as I discussed earlier, what rules do you want them to follow? What things should they be allowed to be used for? What do we want to deploy them for? These are not, some of them are technical questions, but they're also societal questions. And I think there are quite reasonable but different answers to those things. Different cultures, different countries would give out different answers to those things. I think there are issues to do with, I mean, it's mostly in the social media realm at the moment, but I think it's going to impact AI too of like, you know, if you ask a, a question about something and there's a political answer left or right, what is the right answer that you should give there? You should you give the answer that the user wants to hear, but maybe it's not accurate, that answer, right? And, but then what is accuracy? So these are debates um, that go beyond AI, but I think will be maybe amplified by AI. So I think it's even more urgent that we, um, we, we, you know, we, we try and find the, the right answers to that as a, as a society, a global society. Um, and that seems quite difficult because uh, it's intermixed with the geopolitical situation, the political situations, and it's, that's hot. Right. Maybe it is part of the reason we have all this situation, right? So um, there's a lot we can talk about, but I do want to give uh, um, 
the QA time for um, especially students. How about we start with a student and then, you know, there are microphones to, on the side. Uh, just go up to, walk up to the microphone. I would really love to start with a student question. <laughs> Honors. Oh, assume you look young, you're like a student. <laughs> <laughs> um, hi, uh, thank you for the talk uh, and the insightful discussions. Um, I'm a PhD student who works on the intersection of robotics and AI. Uh, I'm aware that DeepMind also has some efforts that push the frontier of robotics. So I'm curious about your view of the future of robotics and what people at DeepMind are doing are to push us towards that future. Thanks. Yeah, great question. I mean, my, my view, and this isn't the view of everyone at DeepMind, um, there's different views on robotics. You know, some people think embodiment is going to be critical to AGI itself. So one has to do that. I'm of the view that it's going to be an unbelievably important application of the general AI systems. I'm not sure it's the fastest path to get to AGI to to do to what you know to and to, to insist that it's embodied. So for us, um, we see it as a very important for two reasons. One is it, it's I think going to be a, a really important industrial application area um, with huge uh, uh, implications and impact. Um, it's also used in our fundamental research as a grounding. Uh, problem. So, you know, we're usually often away in some simulation games or science or whatever that is. And sometimes it's good to just ground yourself on a real robot arm or something like that to see if um, your simulation work really holds, right? And, 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 and it also pushes on really interesting things like low data regimes, uh, transfer learning, things like that, that um, I think it's the best setup for that. So we use it as a challenge task quite a lot. Um, and the kinds of works we're doing, we're, we're doing a lot of different types of work from locomotion, robot arms to um, soccer teams trying to learn coordination. So it's quite a wide range of work that we do. Thank you. Let's do this. We alternate on both sides. So you and then you. So we'll go that way. You've got a lot of questions. Like yes. This is your time. Okay. I'll try and answer faster. Yeah. Thank you, Demis, for your talk. Um, as a student, a PhD student here and a scientist, I'm concerned about a technical monoculture where increasingly large resources are devoted to an increasingly small number of future directions. At least that's the perception. Um, what are your thoughts on sort of our roles as scientists and your role as a scientist and a funder of scientists in this problem? Yeah, great question as well. Look, I, I, I kind of agree with that in the sense that that is the direction things are going in and, and that's where the money, because it's sort of like, you know, it's been so successful. It's kind of monopolizing a lot of the, a lot of the, I guess, scientists and money and talent. Um, DeepMind's always been an incredibly broad church of research. We, I think, we've historically been. I mean, we're quite large, but we've also been the the, the broadest in terms of you know, from neuroscience ideas to uh, obviously deep learning, reinforcement learning, all of these things. So we have many, and we have theorists as well. And then on top of that. We have a whole science team, so we've always had multidisciplinary, very multidisciplinary what we do. But even there, we've had to slightly change our emphasis, you know, to to um, to put more emphasis on the large models and the pre-trained models, and, and especially in terms of compute. And if you look at the compute uh, resources, it's just the way it is. And as I said, you know, I, I, I'm of the opinion that they are necessary. So I think one has to do that work. I think that's clear now after several generations, they're not just going to simply asymptote. You know, I think if you saw GPT-1 or 2 or one of our early language models, maybe you think, oh, you know, maybe it's still just memorizing or something. But I think we've definitely gone past that point. So one has to, that, I think the only scientific thing to do is to explore that to its limit. But while still, at least a deep mind, the resources I'm in control of exploring, you know, maybe more than half the organization is still exploring um, other innovations that might be needed, whether that's memory planning, some of the other things I mentioned, and and I'm um, kind of fifty fifty whether that's going to be needed or and whether the, the the large models be enough on their own. Right, and by fifty fifty, that's not a precise number. It just means I don't know, right? Really don't know. And so, if it's in, in when you're in that much uncertainty, in my if you in my view is you've got to press hard on on both those sides, exploiting what you know and exploring the new things. But I think. As an industry, we're probably over in, you know, probably that isn't going on everywhere else. I think mostly they're like 90% or maybe even 100% all in on the current techniques. Um, but, you know, we're more like 50-50. Yeah. 
do you know what you're going to do in PhD now after his answer? <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> okay. uh, hi there. Hi. First of all, thank you so much for coming to give the talk. Definitely the highlight of my day so far. Um, and second of all, I wanted to pose a more meta-level question. And so um, you mentioned during the talk that a lot of research is learning how to ask the right question. And so um, what I wanted to do is kind of reflect that back to you and ask you, um, considering that DeepMind is one of the leading um, places where research is done is on AI, how do you approach asking the right question? What, are your general, what is your general approach to research to um, get to effective conclusions to do the groundbreaking work that you've done? Yeah, look, I, I spent many, many years, um, I guess, intuitively trying to hone that ability. And then more recently, I think I sort of hinted at it in the talk, which is... Um, now we've done this several times. We can, you know, I've really boiled down as to what it is that we're good at. What is it that we've actually done? And then I've, you know, um, trained myself to be quite a broad scientist to be able to kind of dive deep, sort of dip into something and then try and understand maybe from an expert in that domain what their problem is and then remap that, right, to, to problems that I know. Um, it may not, you know, won't be exact mapping but it's close enough. And then the differences can be, uh, you can make an assessment about how likely that is to work. And that's served us, you know, that's served us very well. Sort of picking a problem in the sweet spot, I often call it in the S-curve problem. And games are great for this because every, every, you want to you you pick a problem that's not too easy because then it's going to be trivial and not stretch your general algorithms. But if it's too hard, you won't be able to perceive if you're making any progress at all. So. Um, so you want to always be in that sort of sweet spot of the S-curve. And you can do that with something like games, but also science by keep on picking a harder and harder thing as your understanding of what your capabilities of your systems can do. So that's um, kind of one of the big things I've used. Another thing, I mean, I have many tricks, but maybe I should write a, you know, an op-ed or something about it at some point. But another thing I've used in the past that's been good is if you surround yourself with lots of smart people and multidisciplinary people, and then you present a problem to that group. Um, often the speed and quality of the ideas that they brainstorm, that I found quite a good measure of the, um, the suitability that, of, of the right time to tackle that problem. So if, you, if it's sort of flowing easily, and there's a, it doesn't matter if the ideas are actually good or not in the end, but if they're kind of plausibly good, plausibly interesting ones, and they're pretty easy to come up with, and there's lots from lots of people, that usually suggests to me that there's a lot of um, uh, uh, progress potential there. I found that as quite a good measure. Maybe other people already know that. I don't know. But it's one I found that's quite useful. Thank you so much. Hello. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for your talk. I'm also a PhD student here. Um, I think when I see DeepMind's work, it's really fascinating to see how you're really pioneering the whole AI for science field and you spoke of many different applications. It also seems like it, um, when you spoke about like the common motif across all of scientific research, right? Like this um, uh, search problem. So it, 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 feels still, it feels like it's, it's really sort of uh, pointing at uh, a, a space for like a base foundational model for, for, for scientific research in general. And it seems like your work at DeepMind really sort of motivates that. So is this something that your, your, your group has thought about? Yeah. That look like, I mean, and I think you you mentioned an AI research assistant, but I think it's maybe it's a bit more than just yeah. literature research. Right? I agree, I agree. It would be more than just literature research to have the ultimate one. I think I think that is um, a way, uh, definitely a very promising route. And I think our work, I think you correctly identified our work does point in that direction, and we're exploring that. We call our models base models, um, but it's basically they're foundation models. And um, and I think there is a potential for building a kind of general model that would be good across scientific space, not just do literature, but maybe do some experimental things, probably, perhaps possibly, you know, suggest experiments, this kind of thing. Um, I think that is very likely to be possible to work. So, yeah, I would, I would encourage that direction. Hey, I'm also a PhD student. This question is sort of related to my own experiences, but how do you know when it's time to double down or give up. So you put out AlphaFold 1, you get 60%, and the next competition is in two years from now. Yeah. You have a decision to make. Yeah. And you guys really double down on sort of that decision. You rewrote everything. It worked out great. Yeah. But are there ever times when it doesn't work out as well? And sort of what is your mental framework around assessing that decision? Yes, that's a great question. And uh, we do have a lot of heuristics for that. So... Um, 
with AlphaFold, you know, it, it is case by case. Obviously, like you have to see why you've hit a brick wall. And, and, and one of the things I use for that is what I mentioned earlier. Like you get a different set of people in the room to look at that problem and look at what you've just done. How many new ideas is it? And how, what, what's the, um, the flow of that, right? It's not just how many. It's the, it's the quality and how hard was it to do that. That is a good, so there was a lot of ideas around an alpha fold too in that particular case from a different set of people. We actually had to change the team quite a lot too um, to get a different approach um, and, and a different a technique. Um, but there are other things too. Like we've, we've been many times through this dark valley of, I mean, most of research is like that. You do something super hard, it's going well, and then, then it's like some big problem. And this is pretty normal. And once you've been through it a few times, you, you first of all, not to panic. Secondly, um, to look for orthogonal, this is where I think multidisciplinary can help. You look for orthogonal signs that you might be on the right track. So one thing I did with AlphaFold is, one reason we picked AlphaFold and I started it after AlphaGo was that, do you remember there was this Fold It game? Um, so I don't know if those, some of you know in protofolding, it was like a citizen science game where they, um, I think it was the Baker Lab, they, they turned uh, protein folding into a puzzle game. So it was literally a 3D puzzle game and you bent a protein's backbone and things like that. I came across it when I was studying at MIT in about 20, 2009, 2010. I think it had just come out then. And amazingly, they got, it wasn't that fun a game, but there was quite a few gamers who wanted to do science with their gaming skills. And maybe like 10,000 people played it, and some of them got really good. And they actually discovered two or three um, real protein structures, and they were published in Nature, I think. Um, and I saw that, and that made me, that, that, you know, I was thinking, well, that's incredible because... Um, someone who's not an expert biologist has used their intuition to make some sometimes counterintuitive moves that look energetically wrong, but that actually would end up being right. And, uh, and what I thought was what gave me confidence with AlphaFold 2 specifically is we'd already mimicked the intuition in AlphaGo of, in my view, some of the world's top pattern matches, right? The, the, the Lisa Dole, he's played Go since he was two. He didn't go to normal school. He went to Go school. And he's played that his whole mind is go. It's an incredible guy, right? And and it's this, um, you know, it's his whole universe. And yet we were able to mimic his level of intuition, let's say, somehow with our AlphaGo system. So I thought if we could do that, and then amateur gamers were able to solve using this tool with their presumably pattern matching, as presumably what was going on, proteins, then um, that must be tractable too. So. Although that's not a definitive reason to continue, but that was one reason. And then the other reason was that somehow physics does solve this seemingly untractable problem, right? We live, we, we exist. Um, the proteins get folded in our bodies all the time. Um, sometimes they get misfolded in disease, but, but they're folded. So, um, so you know, in, in theory, that should then be tractable if you believe a bunch of things about classical systems and quantum systems, but that's out of scope. So I, I used... Uh, some of these heuristics to try and um, give you confidence to double down. Thank you very much. Great. Um, we have entered the fast questioning, okay. fast answer phase. Yes. Of yes. <laughs> Sorry, I thought we did it fast answering. Great uh, questions. There. Hello, I'm, I'm a graduate student and I'm also involved in AI research. And my question is um, how should technologists, scientists, those investigating and researching these challenging problems bring in the perspectives and ideas of people from marginalized communities, um, particularly those who do not come from a scientific background? What infrastructure do you imagine being um, created to accomplish this? Yeah, I think it's a really important question, and we, we think about this all the time. And when I say multidisciplinary, I don't just mean scientists. We have actually ethicists, social scientists, um, uh, uh, philosophers. Um, at DeepMind, and also we work externally with those types of people. So we try to bring many perspectives into our work, and um, when we, you know, design things and deploy things, um, and we pay a lot of attention to that. And I think the community itself could do better, um, and we could also still do improve. Um, but it's very much at the forefront of our mind that to get as many inputs as possible into the designs of these systems and how they get deployed and um, especially the types of people that it might affect. I think that's a very key thing that we should be doing as part of the thoughtful deliberation that we, I was mentioning in the scientific method. And, and the understanding part is to understand the consequences of what you're doing. Um, butterfly effects, if you like, not just the, maybe the intent that you had, but also uh, the unintended consequences better too. I think that's all part of making sure it's good for everyone in society. 
I do also want to add that here in America, uh, part of the effort is democratizing uh, resource for AI research. So Stanford um, and HAI have been leading uh, the leading lobbyist of this bill called National AI Research uh, Resource. It's an AI and uh, compute and data uh, platform that the federal we're asking the federal government to uh, set up and. Uh, one of the uh, key clause or ask in that is uh, reaching to the traditionally underrepresented uh, community. So it's a major uh, policy effort that Stanford is leading. Thank Again, you. we're we're having increasing number of people asking questions, so so you do need to keep your counsel. <laughs> Hi, Demis. Um, I'm an undergrad here. Um, a big takeaway I learned from your talk is the long-term perspective that DeepMind takes to, to its research. And along that line, what were some of the core founding philosophies that you um, helped cultivate at DeepMind in its early ages uh, to enable it to continuously innovate um, at the frontier for as long as it has? Yeah, I mean, there's so many. It would, be, it would take a whole talk to sort of go through that. But I think there were some techniques we bet on early that when we were very rigorous about that. So we're so um, learning systems, not 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 expert systems, right? That we made that decision early. That wasn't obvious in 2010, and that led us to reinforcement learning and deep learning as being core to what we do. Using inspiration from neuroscience and things like memory replay, episodic memory, these kind of things. That was also core. Um, understanding the compute would become a huge factor. So, and we knew about GPUs and all those sorts of things from gaming. So this was all different threads that we backed early. Um, and then the idea of using simulations and games as a test platform rather than we could have chosen robotics or something like that, so, uh, which I think would have made our progress much more slow. And I think a lot of people who were doing that kind of work back then, even at MIT, were working on uh, robotics platforms. And I spent some time with them. What I realized was that they were spending all their time fixing the server motors and the hardware and almost had no time left over to work on the on the on the, the software, which I thought was the the, pro the the problem, right? For AI, so so that was another reason to choose games, and obviously because also I knew lots of games engineers and brought them on board early, so that was a and I knew which games to choose and all of those things, so that was a, easy for me. But it also made um, strategic sense, I would say, and so uh, so those are all things that we stuck true to. Also, to be honest with you, starting in London and being in the UK. That's where I'm based uh, and where I did the most of my studying. And I just knew there was a lot of untapped talent in Europe and the UK. And I also thought, and I think this goes to um, geographical diversity, um, although, you know, we're, we're part of Alphabet, but we're still very much a UK-based company and, and European in our outlook. And I think it's important that in the global debate about, about uh, AI, you know, of course, there's China and there's US, but there's also, I think we, we sort of represent Europe. In the, at the forefront of this technology and at the, at the top table of what's going on. So I feel that responsibility too. And that was something that was recommended to me not to do. Like, you've got to move to Silicon Valley. Like, all of everyone was saying that, and, you know, all our early funders and other things, but I resisted and, and uh, for, you know, for various reasons. But I think that was one of the reasons. And I'm pleased that we bring that perspective as well. Thank you. Really, really, really inspiring. And Great to see what you're contributing to the world of science and world of AI. And uh, students, great questions today. Yeah, Thank you. really good questions. Thanks, everyone.